Chapter 74, Al Mudaffir. We learned in previous programs that Al Araq, the first five verses of that chapter, were the first verses revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Sallam. He was in the cave on the mountain of Hira outside of Mecca fasting, thinking, meditating uh, about the problems of his society, the great injustice and evil that had been brought there because they had rejected the religion of Abraham, the founder of Mecca, who built the Kaaba or the holy house of Allah SWT at Allah's command and dedicated Mecca to the worship of the one God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. However, over the generations, people had been misled by Satan to establish shrines, idols, dedicated to the name of various gods other than Allah SWT. Prophet ﷺ received the first verse, Iqra, read, recite the Qur'an, and he saw the angel Gabriel there in the cave. Then he left and he descended from the mountain. At this time, or perhaps at a later date, it's unclear because there are various narrations, he was descending from the mountain of Hira outside of Mecca and he heard a voice calling his name and he looked to his right, he looked to his left, he looked behind and then he looked up, he saw the angel Gabriel seated upon a throne filling the horizons before him. He became very frightened and agitated and he wasn't sure why he's having these visions and hearing these, these words. And he went back home to his wife Khadija. And he told Khadija, wrap me up in blankets and then pour some cold water over me because he was very frightened and sweating. And, and she did so. And then he heard the revelation of these first words. Oh, you who are wrapped up or enveloped in your garments or in your blankets, rise up and warn your people. <laughs> So he didn't simply receive guidance and revelation for himself alone, but it was for all of his people and in fact for all of humanity. But first the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to talk to those people who were closest to him, his nearest friends and family members who believed in his message immediately because they were the closest people to him. And to, and to uh, talk to his relatives and his kinsmen the Quraysh tribe, who are the descendants of Ibrahim by his son Ismail. Some of them also believed, but many, many, especially the powerful and wealthy, rejected the message of Islam. One of them, the most powerful and wealthiest of them, was Al Walid ibn Al Mughira, one of the powerful leaders of the tribe of Quraysh. And when the Prophet started going out and preaching and reciting these verses of the Quran that had been revealed to him, he was initially attracted to that message. But he became disturbed and he called people, let's see what we should do about this message. And some of them said, let's say that it's a, he's a poet. He said, no, clearly this is not typical poetry. Some said, let's say he's a magician. But clearly he was not a magician trying to cast a spell or hypnotize people. He was trying to get them to think and follow a message. Uh, let's say he's a fortune teller, but he was also not trying to predict people's futures. So finally, al walid said, well, the closest thing that we should say then is that he is a poet, which he has received from the past. So let's agree upon that. And that grieved the Prophet very much. And that led him to want to just stay at home in bed and, and put the blankets over his head. But the, Allah was saying to him, do not be aggrieved. Do not let your grief uh, and your distress affect you and pre prevent you from sending this message. But arise and warn your people. And of course he did say to them, what do you say about me? And of course they said, that you're, we trust you, you're the trustworthy one. He said, if I warned you that there was an enemy over this hill coming this way, would you believe me? And if, of course they would. They would have gone out and prepared themselves for war. And then he warned them of the coming punishment of Allah SWT that they did not uh, remake their lives in the pattern which was commanded by the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed by uh, the almighty Lord of the heavens and the earth.
in verse 3 he said to make takbir or magnification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it means that Allah is greater than all things that his attributes are perfect and therefore only he need be feared only in him should we hope for any help or any provision and therefore we should devote ourselves in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to believe that he is above everything in this universe and only he in his perfection and superiority deserves our worship and our obedience. <laughs> then Allah said to the Prophet ﷺ, to purify your garments. And this, there's quite a lot of discussion of the tafsir or interpretation of this verse. Because the Arabs have a saying of purifying your garments means being pure at heart or purify your intentions. Which means every action you do, you do so for the sake of Allah alone. Also, uh, being pure of garment, pure clothes mean to be sinless, meaning not to commit sins. But if you are representing the religion of Islam, you have to be pure in your actions and avoiding doing things which are sinful. Finally, it's also related the Arabs did not used to purify with water. They would still go and worship Allah or worship their gods with dirty clothing. We're commanded in Islam that our clothes have to be purified as well as the place of prayer if from any unclean substance as well as our hearts being purified from any intention of worshipping other than Allah alone. Verse number five. The exact opposite thing are those things which are unclean and sinful and unholy. We have to keep away from them. The interpretation which is, is well known of this verse is to keep away from idols and Allah declared in the Quran that the idols are rigid, they are impure and they are unholy and we should stay far away from them. But also any sinful behavior and wicked behavior is under this idea of being unclean and all of them we are being for, forbidden for in general. So these are general universal commandments that Allah has revealed to all the prophets of Islam and he revealed them particularly in the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad to do all things which are pure and good and holy and to stay far away from all things which are impure and evil and unholy, especially the worship of idols or any physical symbols of God or any beings other than Allah alone. In verse 6, do not do so hoping that you will receive a benefit. Do not hope that people will donate money to you and give you money because you have been preaching the message of Islam. But preach the message of Islam uh, for Allah's sake alone and do not expect compensation for doing so. Also, as Ibn Abbas said, do not hope that by, by doing so you will receive uh, a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do it as a worship to Allah alone. Don't wish that Allah will give you great treasures and rewards in this world for your Islam and for your preaching the message of Islam, but wait for his reward in the hereafter. And do not think that your good deeds that you have done in preaching this message of Islam or in worshiping Allah will somehow be a favor that you're doing to Allah. You're doing it for your own sake. You cannot increase Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way in his power or his dominion by being a good Muslim or by spreading Islam or by following Islam perfectly, nor could you take anything away from Allah's dominion or his power or his greatness if you reject Islam or you're lazy and do not observe Islam or you do not, do not teach Islam to others. So Islam is a gift from Allah for the benefit of humanity that we may live a good life in this world and in the hereafter. And so be patient for your, the sake of your Lord in verse 7, that of course these verses were revealed when the time the Muslims were a minority. That they had to be very patient in delivering the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to humanity. We have to be patient in enduring. That is a worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet ﷺ and to the Muslims in general who received the Qur'an to be patient and endure and you will see the reward if not in this life when the trumpet is sounded, a trumpet or a horn 
It's a sound which will be a terrible blast which will destroy everything in this creation and then there will be a second blast in which everybody, the world will be recreated and the people will rise from their graves and be judged before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَذَلِكَ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَوْمٌ عَسِيرٌ That will be a hard and difficult day. عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ غَيْرُ يَسِيرٌ It will be a day that will be extremely difficult for the unbelievers. They will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a day that is 50,000 years long, practically drowning in the sweat underneath this terrible bright uh, light on the Day of Judgment. But for the believers, the Day of Judgment will be easy and quick, like going through one of your daily prayers that you do and it will be over, it will be a happy day and it will be an easy day for you. So in verse 11, Allah SWT is talking to the Prophet Muhammad and says, Leave me alone with the one whom I created alone. Uh, he's talking here about Al Walid ibn Al Mughira, one of the great leaders and one of the wealthiest of the Quraysh, the leaders of Mecca. When Walid initially heard the recitation of the Quran, he loved hearing this recitation. He realized right away he was a very intelligent person. This is not poetry. This is not fortune telling. This must be from Allah. And he went and said so. But then the leaders of Quraysh became concerned because they said, if Walid does it, then other people are going to follow this message. So they went to Walid and said, do we need to like, all of us will gather charity and give it to you, Walid. He said, like, what? Why would I need your charity? I'm the richest of, of all of you. He said, well, you must need something because you're going to these Muslims and listening to their message as if he was going to them because he wanted some help from the Muslims. You must need help, so we're going to help you to stay on our side. And so he realized right away that he said, no, I'm not following the Muslims. I'll have nothing to do with them uh, because he wanted to be on the side of his fellow noblemen, the leaders of Mecca at that time. He did not want to be on the side of the few Muslims who were mostly weak uh, people who were not the wealthy and powerful people of that society. He knew that it was not the invention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but he spread that lie among the people. So Allah said, leave me alone with him. I created him alone. He was born alone. He was naked. He came into this world weak, with no money, with no provision. <laughs> then I provided him with a great amount of provision. He, only Allah gave him long age and good health and made him successful in this world. And so in verse 12, Allah granted him Resources in abundance. Children at his side. He became so wealthy that his grown children, and he is said to have, I think, ten sons. Walid's children could stay at home. He could provide with them from his business partners. And his employees could run his trade between Syria and Yemen, and he could stay at home. And of course, every adult, when they have a, you know, children, their greatest pleasure is to spend their time at home relaxing with their children. And so he was blessed by Allah SWT. Yet he opposed this revelation. And so this is a promise from Allah against him. Allah says he will face a severe sa'ud, which also means a difficult climb. And there are many narrations from the Sahaba talking about the tafsir or interpretation, explanation of this idea of su'ud or a climbing. That Allah SWT will make a very difficult climb for them. In hellfire there is a mountain of fire and they will be obliged to climb and climb and keep trying to climb and it will take them 70 years to get to the top and then they'll just fall right back again and have to climb and climb and climb over and over again. And so Walid made great efforts to oppose Islam despite the fact that he felt in his heart that it was the truth, yet he opposed it and fought it. And so everything will be against him on the Day of Judgment. Like him, seek to conceal the truth from people and lead people away from the truth because he was concerned about his position in the society. He did not want to forsake his position and he wanted to stay the leader and so he tried to keep people away from Islam so that he would be respected among them rather than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Because he was spending his time in thought and plotting, thinking and plotting, planning his response to the Quran. That means that his initial response wasn't rejection. But when he decided to reject, he had to come up with an excuse. Cursed, cut off from any hope in the hereafter because of his plot and plan. Not only did he reject the Quran himself, but he planned how to spread lies about the Quran and about the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, among the people so they would reject it. Then in verse 21, he thought again. Then he frowned and scowled. He turned his back and became arrogant, holding himself above the truth. My worldly position and honor in society is more important than the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran that I even feel in my own heart. And so he came up with his excuse and he said to them, This is a magic from that of old, that Muhammad somehow received some magical teaching from the people of the past by which he could bewitch people or hypnotize them into following his message. In that it is the word of a human being. It is not the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But his initial attraction was the opposite. He said, how amazing are these words of Ibn Abi Kabsha? That was one of their derogatory terms that he used to call the Prophet sallallahu How amazing is it, these words? It cannot be the words of a human being. It could only be the divine words. But then when Quraysh, the leaders of the society heard them, they threatened him and said, you're going to lose your leadership, your position in the society. So that frightened him. And over it are 19 angel guardians. And it may not be clear to some people the meaning of the number 19 here or its wisdom, but we'll find that in the next verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after revealing the previous verse, verse 30, said that there were 19 guardians over hell. And so the leaders of Quraysh, especially Abu Jahl, started making fun of this verse and boasting. So there are only 19 guards. Each 10 of us can gang up on one of them and beat them. And then we will wipe out all the guardians of hell and then we will escape from there. And so they're making fun of and joking because of course they don't really believe in hell or heaven or life after death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded with this verse 31 that the guardians over hellfire are angels who are huge in power and size far beyond any human being. And so of course all of the Quraysh, all the mankind could not overcome them and escape from hellfire. But actually as it says in this verse, Nobody knows the number of Allah's angels and his hosts, but they are a beyond number. They are huge in number that no human being can imagine. 
And then Allah goes on to say, so the people to whom the scriptures were revealed will arrive at a certainty of knowledge. And that is because the rabbis in Arabia, in their books and interpretation of the Torah, already knew that there were 19 angels who were guardians over hellfire. And so this was a test for them. That now they heard this information and they had kept this stuff secret in their books and they did not share this with the Arab people. So there is no way that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would know this information except if it had been revealed to him by Allah alone. And so that those who believe will increase in faith. Because the common believers, the common Muslim, doesn't know this information. And when he sees that the Prophet Sallallahu knows it, and he sees that the Prophet was, had revealed to him information that was known to the people who followed the Bible before, and even information that has only been recently rediscovered by archaeological excavations, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered 50 years ago and had been lost for hundreds of years before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, when we see that that information was known to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that it must be by revelation. And so that will increase our faith and trust. So those people who disbelieve and reject or have a disease in their hearts, the hypocrites who pretend to be Muslims, but really in their hearts there's a doubt about the truth of Islam, they will say, what's the wisdom of this number? Why would Allah say this number? And so they use these things and it leads them astray. It leads them out of iman, out of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus does Allah lead astray those who have evil in their hearts and disease in their hearts. And he guides those who have sincerity and iman in their hearts. This Quran is only a reminder or admonition for humanity exactly the opposite of what Al-Walid Ibn Al-Mughira said, that it was the work for mankind. No, it is a warning and reminder for all of humanity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing those people who have rejected the message of the Qur'an and saying, no, I reject that absolutely. You, there's no foundation for what you're saying or claiming about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or about the Qur'an being the work of human beings and taking that as an excuse to ridicule Islam and ridicule the message of Allah. And he calls into witness some of the signs of his power in creation. <laughs> and swears by the moon and the night when it withdraws and by the dawn in verse 34. <laughs> by the dawn when it brightens. So Allah SWT is showing his power in the cycle of life and death, darkness and night, that every aspect of this world has death and resurrection. So night is death, and then the light of the day is the resurrection after the death. And it is one of the great signs that they have rejected this message and it's a warning to humanity whoever chooses can advance in Islam and whoever chooses can stay behind in rejection so Allah subhanahu wa after talking about hellfire and warning humanity about that uh, is telling us that each one of us is a pledge for what he or she has earned in this world. That we, when we do something on this earth, it counts. It has a value, it has implications in another world beyond this world in the hereafter or in life after death. For example, I help others by giving charity, feeding the poor. I don't lie and cheat and steal because that would destroy the society. I don't commit adultery, sexual intercourse outside of marriage because that will, that will destroy the family structure, which is the bedrock of civilization. And so Allah has guided us to the right way of life. And we wait until the, the fulfillment of this world, when this world is over, the new world, every deed will count at that time. Ashab al yameen or the companions of the right side. In the day of judgment, there will not be 10 groups or 100 groups, but Allah will divide people into two groups. The people of the right, the people of the left. The people of the right are those who have believed in Allah, 
who have acknowledged his oneness and worshipped him alone and obeyed his prophets and messengers. They will be on the right side. في جنات يتساءلون. So the companions of the right will be in gardens of paradise. They will be sitting and enjoying themselves in high places, places, high palaces and high couches in the garden. And they'll sit there and, and talk to one another and, remi- and remind each other, what about so and so? And what about so and so that we used to know in the world? Where are they? What happened to them? And so they will communicate by Allah's power with the people in hellfire. They will ask the look in verse 41. The evildoers, the criminals. It doesn't mean simply criminals who have committed a crime in this world because you could be a sincere believer, a Muslim, and yet be misguided in some aspect of your personality or your life and commit a crime. In a momentary weakness in your faith, you may commit a crime. But then if you repent to Allah, you will be forgiven for that crime. And they will remember people whom they used to know in this world and find out that those people are in hellfire. And they will ask, what caused you to be in hellfire? And the people of hellfire answer and tell the reason why they're condemned to hell. That's verses 43 to 52. They will say, we were not people who used to pray or offer their prayers. Even if they were Muslim and they abandoned the prayer. Even if they did pray, then they were hypocrites who prayed, but only so people would see them praying, not because they sincerely believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verse 44. Nor did they feed the poor. Meaning, first of all, the obligatory zakat or charity, which is uh, owed by any Muslim who has the minimum amount of savings over a one year period, as well as those people who have uh, wealth in other forms, such as agricultural wealth. It's given to the poor and the needy. Or people who are your neighbors, your close friends, your relatives who have the right of your support. And so there are people who are Muslim sincerely, but have denied that they owe it to pay zakat. There are also Muslims who have not denied it, but have been negligent toward people, have been stingy with their money, and they may be punished in hellfire for a time, but they will be removed from hellfire with other sinful people who have iman or have belief in their heart. In verse 45, And they used to speak vanities or falsehoods with vain talkers. Once again, they would go into a place where people were speaking evil denying Allah or abusing and reviling the religion of Islam or the prophets or the actions of Muslims or the beliefs of Islam and they would get themselves involved in that talk and so we have to be very careful about our companions you may have a group of people you like but they speak evil and indecent conversation because if you persist in staying with people like that and keeping them as your friends and your companions they will slowly but surely lead you onto that path where you will gradually start to ridicule and dispute the truth yourself and to be one of the people of hellfire. And importantly in verse 46, they deny the day of recompense. The idea of denying judgment, denying a life after death means that I can get away with whatever I do in this world if I can conceal my actions from the police or from the state or from the courts. I can get away and I can be successful even though I do evil. And that is as if you were insulting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah has no power to bring you to judgment. And so if they do get away with it in this world, that's a proof there must be another world where there is justice. That's a proof that there is a life after death and a resurrection and a judgment on the last day. In verse 47, And there came to them a time that is certain. The certainty is death. Every one of us has a certain amount of misunderstanding of this because we've never seen the world to come. But the true certainty comes at the time of death itself. At that time, it's too late for you to say you're sorry. I repent to Allah, now I believe, because then you will see it. It's a certainty, you will see the angel of death. So Allah is saying, 
فما تنفعهم شفاعة الشافعين. At that day, the, there will be no intercession because an intercessor, please forgive him, I know he's a good person, please don't punish him. On the day of judgment, the intercessor, intercessors will be the prophets. That means that the condition is that you have believed in Allah and believed in and followed his prophets, then they can speak up on your behalf. So what is it then in verse 49? What is wrong with them? What's their problem if they turn away from this admonition, this reminder? They can feel the truth in their hearts if they have even the smallest amount of intelligence and the smallest amount of faith in their hearts. But they're running away from it like a lion is attacking and the zebras or the wild asses or wild donkeys uh, sense the presence of the lion and run away, each one running in a different direction, all in confusion when they just see the lion. So they would see the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu hear him talking, and before they could even hear the message or start thinking about it, they run away so that this message will have no effect on them and they will not be guided by Allah. But each one of them said in verse 52, no, every one of them desires that he should personally be given revelation printed up on pages to come down out of the heaven. I will not believe until I become a prophet, until an angel comes to me and gives me pages written out. Even the Prophet wasn't given any pages. But they wanted to receive a special miracle of pages coming down out of the heaven. But once they receive those pages, they would be making the same proofs, the same teachings, the same commandments, and they would still reject it because they still would dislike having to pray and fast and devote themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah would have no choice but then to physically destroy them. But only the pure prophets of Allah can see the angels of revelation. When the evil, corrupt people see an angel, it's the angel of death coming to take his soul away. And then it's too late for him to repent. So Allah is doing a favor to them by sending them a prophet to guide them. Let's read the final verses. Nay, but they fear not the hereafter. Nay, verily, this is an admonition. So ever will let him read it and receive admonition from it. And they will not receive admonition unless Allah wills. He is the one deserving that mankind should be afraid of and should be dutiful to him. And he should not take any God along with him and he is the one who forgives sins. So Allah is giving us this Quran that we may follow it. May Allah guide all of us to understanding the universal Quran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.